Good morning, police emergency. How may I assist you? Good evening and welcome to this special edition of Ghana Police Watch. Over the last few months, setting news stories have grabbed the media headlines and become the talk of town across Ghana. We note particularly the kidnapping of the three young girls, Priscilla Blessing Bintum, Priscilla Kwanche, and Ruth Lovkwasing in Takradi Western Region, and the murder of Ahmed Hussein Swale, the investigative journalist. We go behind the headlines to bring you the latest information and developments with Ghana's leading crime investigator, C.O.P. Mamiya Tiwa Adudankwa, Director General, Criminal Investigations Department, Ghana Police Service, and Adam Bona, Security Analyst. Before then, though, some news items. Following on from Ghana Police Watch's awareness campaign, Bail is Free, which has won a lot of critical acclaim, we are proud to release this informational cartoon in English and Tree with the kind support of European Union. Kofi is arrested on suspicion of committing a crime. He is taken to the police station where he writes a statement and held in custody pending further investigations. The police can only detain a suspect for 48 hours without charge. Kofi's uncle comes in to secure him bail. Uncle accepts a bail bond of 500 Ghana CDs which he will pay to the courts should Kofi not present himself to the court when requested. Should I pay for the bail? No, you don't pay the police. Bail is free. Only make sure Kofi presents himself to the court when requested. Don't pay for bail. Bail is free. Ghana Police Watch was also at the opening ceremony of the 49th Cadet Officers Course at Ghana Police Academy and brings you this brief report which indicates the persistent changes to improve the quality of personnel and police professionalism as part of the ongoing transformation agenda. It is a pleasure to be part of this official opening ceremony of Cadet Course 49, the third course since my assumption of office as the Inspector General of Police. As a major step in the transformation process, the development of quality line managers is therefore key. This is so because policing is actually real at a tactical level, where you are expected to play your role as a commander. It is important to note that we cannot achieve our vision with poor relationship with the public. We are who the public say we are. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my singular honor to declare the 49th Cadet Officers course officially open. to be trained as part of the transformational agenda of the current police administration to make me fully equipped to deal with the current challenges that the police are facing and to also be a better officer to serve Ghana well. Having joined the Ghana Police Service, the discipline that is required to become a, a police officer together with uh, being uh, a pathologist it's become very important and that's why we are here. Within me as a doctor, I know all I can do is my job as an optometrist, but being here for six months will equip me to do all other things as a policewoman. Now back to our major story. The city buzzer has got the whole city on lockdown. <laughs> For several months now, the rather relaxed Twin City with Second D has been thrown into panic and gripped by fear as a result of the kidnapping of three young girls in August and December last year. Priscilla Bintum, Ruth Love Quasing, 
and Priscilla Kwanji. <laughs> Forget every radio station for now. All right, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. You are still live on Radio Max 105.1. And I'm sure right now you heard about the big issues that almost everybody in Ghana are talking about. The kidnapping cases in the metropolis. News of the Takradi kidnappings grabbed the attention of the whole nation and indeed international interest. This is BU Junction, where two of the girls were last seen. We need to intensify our investigations within the area for having any issue with it. There are many many at night, special units of the police have joined the daily patrols combing the Twin City, especially its outskirts where the kidnappings have taken place. Ghana Police Watch brought you an incisive report capturing the intense fear and anxiety that are taking hold of the whole community. We also brought you exclusive interviews with the family of the girls and the efforts of the police to solve this heinous crime. I will call you call Hello? At one point, he waited all night at a popular junction with his mother waiting for his sister. Man, 25, no catch him there. Yankee Gina, Uncle Fujanshi, now one in the Baba. See that time, no, I'm no mommy. You can Gina. We're privileged to have in the studio this evening the Director General of Police CID, COP Mamiya Tiwa Adodankwa. Thank you very much for making Thank time for to, to join us. And then we also have Adam Bona. He's a security analyst, head of a security warehouse. Thank you too for making time to be with Thank us. Thank you very much. So this week we've had some really good news, which is the fact that at least now, we know where the three missing girls, those who are believed to have been kidnapped from Takradi, we now know where they are. And you deliver the, the good news to us. Now we know where they are. At least we've moved from point A to point B, where we didn't have idea where they were, to we know where we, yeah, they are now. Mr. Bona, this is certainly big news, the fact that we actually know where they are. Because previously, there had been 
talk about the fact that we knew where they are. And I know some government officials actually put out something to that effect. I am happy to hear that, at least as a country, we know where these people are keeping these ladies. And so for me, I think let's uh, hope that in the next 10 working days, we'll have the CID uh, bringing them. Yes. When I say bringing them, uh, so that we can celebrate. So for me, I found it quite reassuring because knowing the way the police work, I know that when they tell you something, they actually know a lot more, which uh, is, is quite reassuring. And I know you're not willing to share with, with us all that, but let's go back to how this, what you've been able to gather so far as to the chronology of events. Yeah, I think um, something that is already in the public domain about how they started social media conversation. And naturally, Ghanaians are very trusting. When somebody shows a little bit of care and passion, you tend to believe and then, then trust that person. And out of that, they were able to lead into like a relationship, I will help you and other things. So they followed up until they met in person and then the incident happened. What sort of help were they offering? Going to help them to secure a job, going to help them to go to school, further the education, whatever you want to become. Probably they wanted to become a journalist like you and they offered them the opportunity to do that. And naturally, they fell for that and that was the reason why they got into contact with them, that guy and then the whole incident happened. Now, so the gentleman who is in custody, the main suspect, yeah. I know that as you've been, it's been very difficult to get information from him. So how have you been able to go around that challenge? Yeah, um, you have a suspect and naturally he will not be willing to tell you everything. So apart from the suspect, the other thing that we've done to be able to get to where we are now. And let me also add that working together with the BNI has been very, very helpful. They've been very supportive and that is why we are where we are now. And the next thing is to make sure that they are reunited to their family members. With and their family. how soon are we expecting that to happen? I'm unable to give the timelines. It could be today, tomorrow. I'm it could unable be today. to. It's, <laughs> that is our hope. So we are still working very hard and we haven't left any stone on turn to make sure that they are reunited. You, Mr. Bonas, I indicated earlier from the way COP is speaking, they clearly, they clearly know what they are about. And uh, if she says that it could be today, tomorrow, it means that they probably already have their hands in there. <laughs> yeah, obviously, if you know the way the law enforcement agencies speak and the way they talk, until so they see the target, you don't put your hand on the trigger if you, if you don't have a target in line of, you know, in your sight. The other aspect with regards to how they were lured, um, I do also have some information that has to look like somehow they were lured with uh, lucrative employment, uh, probably not even within the territory of this country. And so those who are paying attention to us, someone comes to you, tells you, I'm going to get you employment maybe in Dubai, in Emirates, in, you know, uh, Qatar, some of these places, and you fall for it, yeah. then it becomes uh, something, something for all of us. We are spending, I believe, millions trying to yeah. bring them back. We are spending millions because certain they themselves probably, certain things were not done right. And so I think that as part of this program, we should let those uh, mothers and families know that when your kids come to you to say, someone is trying to help me, you should ask questions. Because if, I think one of the parents, one of the men, actually did say he's aware of what was going on between the daughter right. and uh, one of the guys, and the guy was trying to help the, the young woman. But what the dad didn't do was to ask the thought-provoking question. Mm -hmm. It's costing us millions. If uh, Mami Atiwa would tell us how much it costs to get one trained CID officer to work on probably just a simple theft case, so much money. And so to have all these CID people, BNI, chasing this, if, I mean, it's very important, but I think we should learn lessons out of some of these things. What are some of the challenges you have encountered in your investigation so far? Yeah, one of our biggest challenge was even getting the call records, knowing where a call is coming from and other things. And per the rules, you cannot just get this information from the telcos without going through the okay. court processes and other things. And sometimes it becomes time consuming. That's one challenge that we had in the course of so this. But probably you, once 
the information right now and it probably takes you maybe three or four days sometimes like weeks time? before weeks. you can get that information yeah. to you but that information because will then become yes, irrelevant well, so, that, that, yeah. probably we need to look at the way the law the law works for instance if it is something that is so crucial and so urgent and lives will probably be at stake there should be some, the, way, there, there should be some way that should make things easier and then faster for us to have access to those information that we really need. So moving forward, we are in touch with the telcos too. And I think along the line, they had they understood our plight right. and they, they, they were yeah, very, very supportive. And I must add that one too. But the whole idea of what the law says is just to also protect the consumers. Yeah. Because you don't want people having access to uh, that kind of information, you know, just like that. And so the law puts in those checks to ensure that people don't abuse the process. But it's true, but if you go to the well advanced countries, if I mean this is almost like it's a warrant, you know, where you are to be able to access these things. You can go to the judge's home. They do that. Law enforcement agencies, they prepare the the information even if it's midnight. You yeah. just you walk in there, they sign it. It's done elsewhere. From what she's saying, uh, if you look at the incident that took place where the young boy the little boy was snatched. Yeah. Because of the timeliness of the information that was shared. Yeah. It didn't take, I think, less than 48 hours. They had, you know, gotten the, what do you call it, the young man, the victim, and then arrested those who were part of it. It means that in these situations, time is very, of of, is very important. Every minute you delay, these people, they are, usually it's a network. They keep moving. And so look at, you know, how much time we lost. And therefore, yeah. it's made it very, very difficult. Information is critical. Two, four days, one week, week two weeks, <laughs> when people have been kidnapped. The timeliness uh, came to play when it had to do with a one-year-old boy who was uh, ab yes. abducted. Yeah. Because the information got out that quickly enough yeah. that people could work with it. And social media was also quite helpful in uh, getting and the CCTV that captured the look of the woman gave some impression of who this person is. Gave okay. some impression of who this woman is. Yeah. And it's usually very critical in crime fighting. Yes. Now, there was one incident in Tema, or there was one eyewitness, or someone we, mm. th the media spoke with, who indicated that they think they saw the, one of the girls just around the time that uh, she, was, she, was, she was kidnapped. Were you able to speak with this person yes. to get some information? Yes, I did. There was one reverend. I spoke to the person. And the information that he also provided assisted us getting to where we are now. We actually have a, a footage of that uh, video where the pastor, was, the reverend, was speaking. So we get to watch that and then we continue with the conversation. 20th of uh, August. Uh, around 9 to 10 o'clock in the morning, uh, I was on my way to Lome for massaging. And when we got, to, this is where I normally fill my tank. So we came in and my driver was filling the tank. We had almost finished when this car also came. There was this young lady shouting, Munjimio, so it drew my attention, and then uh, I looked at the car. But because I was on my way to go in and urinate, I asked my driver and the petrol attendant to interview the people because, you know, this, this, this is what I said. So I rushed to go and urinate. By the time I came, they had moved off. So I asked my driver, and he said, the, one of the boys opened the door and uh, he, he came out to say that uh, uh, she was their, uh, her sister and uh, she was mentally uh, troubled and they were taking her back home for treatment. But they spoke three, actually. I, yeah, that is what I, And that they were coming from Takradi. And this is how she was behaving all the way from Takradi. If I, I, I didn't take the, the story as true. You didn't believe the story? I didn't believe the story. But I consoled myself that if it will continue, Chokoli, uh, uh, what do you call it, Toe, where they have policemen who have been checking, and then uh, Sugakope is also there. So it is possible 
they may be able to intervene. I spoke to the Reverend and then he provided information and that information has also been very helpful. So the idea about people not taking things for granted, probably on that day, if he had probed a bit further, we would have solved this problem earlier than probably where we are now. So the advice to the public is that we should not take anything for granted, especially when anything is suspicious to you. There's nothing wrong probing further, and if at the end of the day it is normal, you don't lose anything. But what about if it is something that could solve a problem? So everybody should be on the watch out and should be that probing minded so that all of us will help Essentially solve vigilant. Them. Yes, we that is the more, problem. That's the word. Yes, yeah. vigilant, vigilant and then have that probing mind. But then at the time, though, there wasn't that information out about these girls yeah. being kidnapped. And so if probably we had images of the girls or if we got the reports early enough and the reports were put out, the images of the girls were put out, probably at that time, this Reverend would have done a, a lot more than just uh, allow whatever it was to just Well, it, it is true. We have learned a lot. The way the law enforcement agencies are now uh, probably ready when incidents are reported, their response time, you realize that after this other, this three girls were kidnapped. There were other uh, copycat kidnaps, kidnappings, and some of them have actually been jailed. Sometimes you are reporting an incident, and you know our nature. It is the same Ghanaians who are police officers. And so you go to a police station, uh, you report an incident, sometimes depending on the police officer, you might just say, oh, who do they call? Uh, the person will come back. And it's just not this country alone. Even if you in London, if you went into a police station to say you can't find your uh, your relation, they'll tell you to go home. Uh, they will see what the missing person. They don't immediately. It sometimes takes a while, unless of course they have a reason to believe that this could be a serious case. And so I think that for us, it's a major uh, case which the the police would have to, or the security agencies would have to look at to help with how timely they would react. It doesn't matter whether it is a hoax uh -huh. or it is true because then something that you thought was a hoax could be real. Now, one other incident that you talked about, you updated the public about, has to do with the assassination of Ahmed Swali, the investigative journalist. Now, there has been some information that have gone out already suggesting that the suspect was in police custody and then the police let him go. But you're saying that that is not what happened. Yeah. So just clarify for us exactly okay, what um, Let me say that since we started investigating Ahmed Swale's murder, we've had several arrests because we are depending on the account of the eyewitness. So they were able to give us a description of the way the people, the, their looks and other things. This information have been also given out to the public. And then people come day and day giving us information about somebody they might have um, um, seen somewhere re fitting Resembling. that. This. So we'll move on, arrest, we'll look at it, and then this is not the person. So we've had to arrest so many people. So on that day in person, in fact, that informant had come to me telling me that he had identified somebody who fitted the description. So he was at um, Wembley Park when he recognized that person. He went to Kotobabi Police Station to seek help. The policeman who was part of the patrol team and had arrested somebody to the police station was there and he was willing to go with that person. Because of the way the person was holding a gota and also introduced himself as a bodyguard to a member of parliament, the policeman assumed that that person was also a police officer. So he also picked the armed guard on duty at police, Kotobabi police station. They went to the pub. On their way, he called the patrol team that they were needed at Wembley pub for a backup. So they went there. When they went to the pub, this informant identified the guy to the policeman. So this person went there, approached him, and then read his right that he was under arrest, under arrest for um, an assault case that has been reported against him. The moment the policeman approached the guy, there were some friends around. At that time, the patrol team had not arrived. Right. So this informant was outside the pub waiting for the patrol team. 
the patrol team arrived and then the inspector in charge wanted to find out who were they going to arrest, what was the problem and other things. So he told them they should just get inside because one other policeman was already there. The time the inspector went there, this man, the first policeman who had gone to the pub, was actually being like um, beaten. Yes, yeah, 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 my handled. And yesterday, he actually showed me the bruises that he got from that. So at the time, even the inspector got there, the guy already escaped. So apart That's from the patrol, team. the patrol team, the inspector in charge, who also entered the pub, the guy had actually escaped. Now, from the way you've narrated the event, it appears the public were not supporting the police or they were not assisting the police to effect the arrest. They were rather on the side. Because the person the said he was a victim of police brutality that the police were there to either beat him up and other things. So instead of the, the public coming to the aid of the police, they didn't. They rather went to attack the policeman. But why? We've, we've had instances like this, Mr. Bona. How do we deal with these things? Well, I think it has to do with, uh, once again, some behavior of some police officers. Because when on my way here, I met a police officer who someone's vehicle on uh, around East Lego on the Dua Carry, someone's vehicle has broken down. He parked, uh, you know, this their new saloon cars. He parked it on the side and called some men to help push the car off the road, the road. to pave, to allow traffic. traffic to flow. And I thought that is very important. If police officers would become selfless and be more uh, helpful in assisting to the public, I believe that the public would always jump to their defense. defense. But when we begin to see images of police officers, some of them, you know, brutalizing uh, innocent people, then chances are that that perceived mentality that the police would always go after people then kicks in when you see a police officer who probably is going after a hardened criminal, such as the the guy who is suspected to have assassinated Amiswa. So I think that whilst, you know, getting police officers, sorry, the citizens to support the police, it is good to also let the police officers know they are, that some of them, their own behavior jeopardizes what they've been asked to do. Because then uh, if you ask me, I'm not surprised the public, you know, jumped to the defense of this suspected criminal instead of the police and helped the guy to... Uh, run. This case has actually garnered international uh, support. Mm -hmm. Therefore, there is no way, even if you thought there was a police officer who is so corrupt, that police officer will still, in his uh, dream, will never go and take money yeah. for this case. And so, to me, certain things they didn't, they didn't watch. And so, for me, I hope that, uh, you know, this suspect will be arrested quickly, whilst the general public should always be in support of what do you call the it, police. Uh, the police, at best to subdue a suspect. That is what they yeah. don't help in beating, but subduing a suspect, take the suspect to the police station, and that's it. You've done your what the law expects you to do. You know, and so for me, this is very important. Now, and let me add to what Mr. Bona said. We have a service of people of over 32,000. Admittedly, once a while, you can get one or two not doing what is expected of us. It doesn't reflect the general behavior of the Ghana Police no. Service. We have officers who are committed, who are doing well, and who are ensuring that Ghana is safe and people can go about their businesses very well. So when we have situations where one or two police officers go about like going contrary to the law, the public should still have that confidence in us and still support us because Whatever it is, this is the Ghana police service that we have. You don't have any other no. service yeah. again. Yeah. So they need to come out, support us. And even if we don't get it right, they should still believe in us and have that confidence that we'll continue to provide the needed security that the country deserves. Now, this Wendy Lee pub, you indicated that uh, it's a notorious, is known for being a hub for you know, suspected criminals. What is the police CID doing about it? If you know that I'm this is... I'm not going to tell you what we'll be doing. <laughs> but you're doing something about yes, it. Yes. All right. 
Now, one other case which is of interest to many people has to do with the arrest of Nana Pia Mensa, and the chief executive of uh, Men's Gold. We're told that he's been arrested in Dubai. You know, initially, a lot of people actually didn't believe that that was uh, the case. People were wondering, maybe the police, they're just telling us something to throw... People still to, don't even believe it. To, to throw us off. But you're saying, and then we also got news that he had been released granted bill. and then granted bill and yeah. then we arrested and then people are getting confused yeah. saying why is it that he's released and then we don't bring him all back right to okay um along the line when we started investigating um yoko started first um and then police also um started because we got some petition from individual um investors at that time we didn't know where nana pia mensa was so what we did was to obtain a warrant of arrest and then we informed Interpol that they should inform all the 94 member states if they could identify or find this person anywhere. So we issued the red, Interpol issued the red alert and it went everywhere. Then we how, got how quickly did it reach out? Because it, it appears there was a lag between yeah, because when you indicated yes, you had issued it and when eventually. You see, when you send the Interpol red alert, you send it to the head of the, the secretariat. You have to justify the reason why you think that person should be on the red notice. So you support with the reason your state, and they have to appreciate and like understand and accept your reason as something that warrants red notice alert. So you definitely will have a gap, some few hours or some days gap. Then the, pu the public didn't understand why when you go to Interpol website, you, you don't see they, it. They, they, because there's a system. Interpol doesn't talk to member states on their website. So there, there are different levels of information. Sometimes it is given to member states and there's a system that you go there and once the alert is issued, all member states will get it. It doesn't mean they must put it on their website. For instance, where you work, information for your members will not be on your website. When I go to your website, I wouldn't find certain information. It doesn't mean that information is not known to your, the members of, the, of staff or other things. So that was something that probably we tried to clarify. Okay, moving forward. The... Nana Piamensen's case in Dubai, they went to court, he's been granted bail. The court has actually asked him to not to be in police custody. But because of the red notice alert that has been issued by Interpol, he has been re-arrested by Interpol. So he's in custody, and that case has not ended. They, he will still be the going to court. The original case, case has not has ended. He's on bail. So, but what we're trying to do is to look at the best way forward. Which, how do we ensure that he comes back? And this is something that we have to take it at a certain level, and we are working on it. But let me assure the public that their interest is paramount to us. Whatever that we do, we are doing it in such a way that justice will be saved. So we are looking at the criminal aspect of it. We are looking at all other aspects of it. We are also looking at access that we can lay hands on and other things. So we are doing lots of work as far as that case is concerned. Now and C when we moved, we move on, we'll let the public know. Now the CID statement that came out after the red, red um, notice alert was issued mentioned two others. There was the, the sister, I believe, yes. and, and the, the spouse, the wife. We don't have much information on them. Because we haven't been able to have access to them. But whilst Nana Pia Mensa is out there in Dubai, the aggrieved customers are, are coming at you. They are embarking on demonstrations and insisting that government you know, does something for them, intervenes in the situation. How are you managing with that kind of pressure? They are to prevent lots of people coming to, traveling all the way from wherever to come to the CID headquarters. We've created a link so that you go online and then it's like you file the complaint online. We get the information straight away and then we get in touch with you and whatever that you have to provide to us, we do that. So we've been able to collect and every day people keep on adding up to the list, waiting for whenever that you come and then we'll continue from there. But we are still investigating and whenever we hear any asset, we follow up, we make sure that we are able to trace all the assets. This is the way to go, I believe, in the meantime, yeah. Mr. Bona. Well, yes, I think that uh, the Interpol Red Alert allowing the Emirati government to keep him is right. Uh, for me, uh, it's better that way than uh, he 
been, you know, allowed to be free on bail and maybe he absconds from the Emirates and it becomes another thing. But I think we need to be cautiously optimistic. We need to let the general public know, those who have their monies there. First of all, the Emirati government might not, if he's not fortunate and is convicted, government cannot do anything. I've said it. I said it many months ago. The only way would be if uh, he's suspected to have scammed the Emirates up to about $60 million. Uh, the Honorable Minister of Finance will go with a check, sign $60 million, give it to them, and then they'll put him in the next available plane. <laughs> then he comes to answer for his crimes. <laughs> but if we cannot do that, then it becomes close to impossible. It means he has to do time if, in if, there, so we, we need if to. If we had the $60 million, we would have... I so I'm, I'm, just, to I'm, pay I'm, I'm saying that right. so that <laughs> investors would be a little bit patient and not, you know, you see naked demonstrations and, you know, yes, I think we all uh, understand the, uh, call them, the problems they are going through, but that notwithstanding, <laughs> they should be a bit more uh, patient with the authorities who are handling the case because then... Uh, you do naked demonstration, you are naked there, then the next day they give you your money, and then your nakedness is still on social media. It doesn't help. So I think we should, uh, whilst trying to demonstrate, we should be a bit more polite in the way uh, we demonstrate. Yeah. Now, one other major breakthrough you've had this week, uh, or you announced to us this week, is the busting of that uh, criminal syndicate yeah. that goes around uh, raping and robbing. And robbing. Yeah people and involved those British girls yeah. who were, were victi their, their victims. Tell us how you, you were able to nab these people. Um, I think earlier on we indicated how CCTVs are tools for that to assist investigation. In fact, our breakthrough came because somewhere that they had gone after the crime had a CCTV. So we were able to get an idea who the people were, and that was how come we got a picture of one of the suspects that we declared wanted. Um, we knew through social media, again, it has its negative impact and yeah. it also has positive impact. So the picture that we got were actually from Facebook. We got a Facebook picture, we published the person, and through that, the public assisted us. And let me say that in spite of the fact that sometimes we have challenges with the telcos, in this particular instance, they were very, very helpful. Because it got to a point where you have to move to the big men at the telcos and tell them, hey, this is our challenge and we need this information like yesterday. And they were very helpful. That was how come we've been able to get to where we are now. We've arrested two of the three because one person got a hint and then he ran away. But the good news was that we were able to have access to his room. We got his pictures and then we got some other information that is also assisting us to trace where he is now. And fortunately too, when they were arrested, we were able to get them to lead us to other places that they brought from June last year. The idea is that when something happens, this incident happened on the 8th of December, and we've been able to break through in March. It means that when something happens, it doesn't mean we've gone to sleep. We work day and night. It takes time. It takes time, and it doesn't mean we will not break through. But the mode of the operation of this gang is quite worrying. Yeah. The fact that they feel that they have to, they are robbing you, but they have to rape you. Yes. Why would they want to do that? Um, I don't know. It's, that is their trademark. So most of the robbery that they did, unless they, there wasn't any female in the, in, the, in the house. And one instance where they couldn't because the ladies were not in that right mood, they had to beat the ladies very, very well, severely. So it is their trademark and that is what they do. And any time, I think from records, any time that you have robbery and rape, definitely you have a Nigerian. Definitely, you have a Nigerian in it, and it has been proven consistently. When we make arrests, you know that there's a um, robbery and there's also rape. You have to be looking for somebody, maybe probably Ghanaian, but definitely with Nigerians. Mr. Buna, are you able to tell why they would behave that way, want to rape their victims? Yes. Uh, if you look at the mind of the criminal, some of them will want to inflict that psychological pain. In, in you and also to taint you uh, 
uh, make making it very difficult Leave for you, you with to, a stigma yes you know making it difficult for you to you know cooperate with the law enforcement agencies because when you are raped you know the stigma is not just this country other places yeah. where people were raped 50 years ago up to today they are not able to come out and say it and so they do that with the idea that uh, once that is done, it becomes difficult for you to come out because then family members, maybe uh, if, you, if you are married, you know, your husband might divorce you. I know a minister, a former minister of state, whose house was robbed. That former minister is still uh, living. Whose house was robbed and the wife was raped before him. The next week, the following week, they divorced. Okay, they divorced. And so it tells you, uh, and, and the issue probably never even ended up in police station. This happened in East Ligon. It never ended up in police station. And the simple reason is that the minister feels, you know, this is dirty. If he goes to report, he, he used to be a, you know, uh, MP minister. Uh, how would people take it? Divorce the wife and that house, I think, either they've sold it. And so it's just to inflict... So much pain. And so the Nigerians who are listening to us, uh, Madam, who is the chief detective in Ghana, is telling you that crimes that are committed, uh, you know, and they're, they're slightly to be raped, a Nigerian is involved. And so don't do these things. Don't even commit the crime you know, because they would arrest you. And so these are some of these very worrying lies, it's very worrying, yeah. Now these criminals, the, the suspects that you also arrested, have they, I know they've been quite cooperative in yeah, uh, yeah. sharing with you yes. information. Are they able to tell you in what state of mind they are? Is it that they get intoxicated or they take some drugs? Even though they've not admitted, they always take drugs before they go on, um, on that operation. Uh, operation. But that is what we suspect because we just didn't understand why after you've gone to rob you've taken monies you've taken huge sums of money why would you want to do that in addition so probably they are likely to be under the influence of drugs alcohol and something and they are not in control of their mind so that is what we suspect but we are still looking at the possible whether they have some drugs in them and other things it's something that we can always find out when we talk about resourcing of the police, we, we know that the police, it's obvious that they, they really don't have all the resources they need to, to function. How then are you able to pull through? What is, what is your situation? Um, I don't think it, there's any police organization that has all the resources that they need. So let me say that over the last few years, maybe like since I became Deputy Director General, Director General CID, we've been giving some sort of um, logistic support and coming to capacity building. When we took over, we realized that most of the detectives were not trained. And you can go to a station where out of maybe 10, you can have two who have been trained. So what we've done for the last two years to ensure that if you call yourself a detective, then you should go through some sort of training. When 2017, 2018, every day you hear people com coming to you to complain about the behavior of the detectives. I sent my case and it hasn't been handled when another thing. Now I'm not receiving the um, the complaints, complaints at, at least once a while, somebody will come and complain. It means the training that we've done so far is having impact on the way that they, 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 they work. Last year, the whole of last year, the Tetris Training Academy was very busy. And then we look at the caps. Now, currently, we have station officers that when you go to police station, that is the first line of supervisors. They are on training now because we realize that apart from the investigators, there's the first line inspectors that we call them station officers before you move to the um, district, uh, district crime officers and other things. If we are able to get it right from the basis, it will go a long way to help the senior officers because they are district crime officers and the district will be having about three or four stations under the district. So why don't you empower the station officers even more so that they can supervise the investigators well before the cases also get to the crime officers and other things. We've done a lot and I think it's having good impact. And our intention is that when we finish training everybody, we'll go back and do retraining. Currently, we started 2017 with six weeks training. Last year, we added another week, and this year, we are doing eight weeks training. 
because when you look at at the end of the training you do evaluation and then you look at something so this course should have been four hours instead of three so you do that and realize that you have to add a little more to it then this year too we are actually inviting judges judges who sit at the criminal judges to also come and tell them the expectation when they sit at the bench what do they expect from investigators and that one is like a summary of all that they do and that is the last a day before they graduate that is when we bring two judges to come we write to the chief justice he gives us judges to come and talk to them so that they will actually understand and appreciate the expectation of the bench so that when they are investigating they will know that when i do that even though the crime might have been committed by this person, but for technical reasons, I have to do it in this way so that my case is not thrown out. So we've done a lot and we'll continue to ensure that the investigators are updated with skills and knowledge so that they can serve the good people of Ghana better. Again, one thing that is also going against us is uh, the public perception. We've also added another four hour of training on understanding your clients, understanding your customers. Okay. And we have somebody, trained person, coming to tell them the psychology of a victim of crime when they come the way they are and how you have to manage them. Because most of the things that the public are not happy about is not because of the technical aspect. It is the soft skills, how you can even talk to a victim of domestic violence. How can you assure the person that that person is going to get justice? So we've also introduced that aspect to it. And not only at the Detective Training Academy, but I want to bring it to all aspects of the training of the police officers. So we are doing a lot of work, and the impact will be felt very soon. Indeed, training is important. And it's, it's, it's refreshing to actually hear you say clients, because a lot of people, I don't, I'm not sure if police officers actually appreciate that the people they're dealing with, the members of the public, are actually their clients? Most of them don't. Most of them don't, but it is refreshing uh, to have the CID boss saying that we are now beginning to let our officers know that the general public is your client and therefore deal with them as say if you are selling uh, goods and they come, if you don't deal with them well, they won't come to you. And so it's very refreshing, but I think uh, so far so good, maybe for a very long time, uh, uh, some of us haven't seen the police, you know, undergo some of these changes. 2015, I had an incident where some workers, you know, did something and I personally arrested all of them, one by one, took them to the nearest police station. and. Uh, you know, this case was presented in court, and it was as if I was the suspect. <laughs> the investigator did not talk to me. Before you present this case to court, I am the witness in chief. I'm expecting you to take me through how you are going to prosecute this. So they put me in the dock, and they are asking me questions, and I have no clue what they are talking about. Yeah. <laughs> so eventually, the judge has to stand the case down. So I petitioned the CID at the headquarters, 2015, 2014, thereabout. And eventually, I, you know, highlighted 13 areas that I thought <laughs> they fought. And eventually, I'm told they use it for part of their training. <laughs> Refreshing that now uh, I'm hearing that they are working on uh, training officers. And I think they should, uh, since Madame is here, she should do some certification they should be given certificate okay, you know the the, the, the work of uh, a detective is a career that if you if and they are well sought after wherever you are in the world i mean every organization in this country should be looking forward to employing a detective either a retired detective or someone who didn't retire but left the business because these are people who know their work and would help you to be able to investigate things. But when they are trained and they are not given some certificate, then the person is not no longer a police officer, a detective. And the person is difficult to now go and prove that yeah, I had yeah. this certificate Training, so that we, we will know. The military seems to have a, a college or for even police officers to go to. But you have the police college in Tesano. And if I wanted to do let's say a master's program, MSc in, in criminology. You have Manam who should be training people in this aspect. There are people who have retired who can do this. 
And essentially, uh, you are okay. suggesting that it's open to the public. It's open to the public so that the more people get to go to these uh, institutions, they get to learn a bit about policing. But you go to the Kofi Annan peacekeeping, it's more to do with military. more military inclined. Yeah. But we need more of police inclined training. Sponsor. Yeah, okay. Let me respond to Mr. Adam Bonner. <laughs> Your challenge will soon be solved. Currently, the CID is working with the University of Cape Coast Department of Forensics. We are working together and we want to affiliate to the University of Cape Coast Department of Forensics. Okay. They've developed a training program for us on crime scene. On the 5th of May, we are starting um, crime scene management scene because that is also another challenge that we yeah. have how to manage, secure the crimes in another thing. And the University of Cape Coast Department of Forensics got some funding. We developed the course content together and we are piloting with 50 of our officers drawn from nationwide. At the end of the day, we, after that, we roll out the All whole. Right. And the certificate will be given by the University of Cape Coast. Good. Not only that, we are currently working and tomorrow we have stakeholders meeting with the University of Cape Coast where we are trying to develop a certificate and even diploma in crime investigation. So we have moved on, we've gone far. It's, I think, come, when you go to University of Cape Coast website, you can see CID okay. uh, collaborating with the University of Cape Coast to come out with a course in um, crime investigation, which will be open to the general the public. public. Of course, it is not, wouldn't be for free. And yeah. even we as a police, we have to pay, pay something yeah. for, they will do most of the courses in, at the uh, police academy, the detective training academy, and the graduation will be done like any other. Yeah, okay. um, so exactly. when you come back, you when you go through that training and probably you retire or you leave the police service for whatever reason, you come out with a certificate and if you are an investigator, you have a certificate issued by a recognized yeah. university in Ghana. So that one, we are also working on that. All and right. very soon, that one will also We're, we're happy out. to hear yeah. that. And talking about training, we also got to, we got news about the fact that you had to, you were the FBI yes. for some engagement. Yes, if you could yes, just share yes, with yes, us that, the that's experience. That's one. Um, I was fortunate, I've been fortunate to be nominated to attend FBI, heads of chiefs of police, training. In fact, it is the highest level of training that they do for their chiefs and their deputy chiefs of police. Apart from the training itself, the meeting of other chiefs of police, sharing ideas, also getting to know that even the people have, they don't have all the complements of yeah. their logistics needs. That was very refreshing. I thought they had everything. So we've done the first They part. have a lot more. <laughs> So that one is also there. So I'll go back and yeah. I think it's another area that has also improved my capacity, especially heading um, criminal investigation department. In fact, they were telling me I am the head of FBI if I was in the U.S. Because, nah. so yeah, oh, yeah. As <laughs> it turns out. Yes. Anyway, so congratulations. And I think congratulations. Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes, yes. So congr congratulations. And we are hoping that uh, you continue to uh, achieve more of these and then uh, become a, a better police. <laughs> Catch all the bad guys. FBI chief. <laughs> Catch all the bad guys for <laughs> yeah, us. Thank Indeed. you very much. Yes. So maybe final word that I want to give to the public. Um, Ghanaians, like I said earlier, are naturally trusting. When we get people who show a little bit of care and affection, we shouldn't go out, trust them so much that to give certain information about us to them. Let, Most let of our them, guard down. Yes, okay. let our guard down. Most of them will take undue advantage of that and then go about doing all kinds of things. Well. And then again, we want the public to continue to support the police officers. The, most of the criminals live with us. We know them. It is when you support by giving us information will help us in the fight against crime. Crime fighting is a shared responsibility and everybody must come on board. Thank you. I'm sure you can care. Yes, yes, yes. It's true. And I think that just like uh, Madame did say, usually when we have incidents of emergency, we call radio stations and Israel, I have a problem. I think people should take note of the emergency, police emergency, the 191 and then the 18555. Uh, five, five. These are numbers, I mean, the, even though the IG and the police is saying there are too many prank calls, I believe that uh, once they begin to arrest people and prosecute them, they will stop. And uh, uh, hoping that the uh, information flow would be bigger. Since uh, Ghana Police Watch is now the, you know, uh, mouthpiece of, yeah. uh, in terms of communicating these things. Policing in the 21st century has to do with how information is shared. Less they should give uh, what is required to the team who are doing 
this work so that uh, we can appear here more yeah. and talk more. <laughs> yes, All thank right. you very much. Thank you very much, uh, <laughs> DCOP Mamiya Tuadudankwa, the Director General of Police CID, and Adam Buna, who's uh, the Head of Security Warehouse. Thank you for making time to do it. And thank you too for watching Ghana Police Watch. Have a good night.